I'm seven years old, and I'm trying to think of what to do. My mother comes in, and she's holding a book and some paper and a pencil. And she said, I thought I'd like to draw. And I said, OK. She hands me the book and the piece of paper and the pencil, and then she leaves. And I start looking at these, this, this book that she gave me. And I'm thinking, these are weird drawings. These were done by a, a grown-up. But you know, I kind of like them. They're 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 uh, they're amorphous. They have captions with them, but I don't understand the captions. They're they're. I mean, I can read them, but I don't understand them. Um, I, I'm like captivated by these drawings. Hours pass, and. I, uh, I, my mother comes back in, she said, can I see what you did? And I said, yeah. And she looks at my drawings, and her face softens, and her eyes light up, and there's a happiness about her that just makes me so happy. Um, I've, I made my mother happy. I'm hooked. So now I'm 22. I have my sights set on the New Yorker magazine. I'm drawing cartoons all the time. After work, on the weekends, I'm drawing, 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 drawing. I'm set, setting my sights on the New Yorker. And today's the day I'm supposed to submit my cartoons to the magazine. I've done this before, and I'm just getting ready. I'm, I'm getting all my stuff together, all my, all my cartoons, and I'm getting, you know, looking at them and making sure that I like them, and I'm putting them in the right order, and then getting them in the envelope. And, and I stop and I look on my bookshelf is a small envelope that my mother had given me and it had cartoons and drawings that she'd cut out from the New Yorker when I was little as if to say see you can do this and I put it on my shelf after she died so I get my stuff together and I and I head out the door and I lock the four the four locks on my door and go down the three flights of stairs and stairs and I head head towards the the subway the IRT number one down to Times Square and I get off at 42nd Street and I come you know emerge from underground and I you know I pick up my pace like a good New Yorker and then I get towards 43rd Street and my pace starts slowing. My pace is not slowing because I'm early for anything. I'm right, you know, about on time. The New York, you, you, uh, you submit on, on Wednesdays at, at noon, and I'm about on time. I'm slowing because I'm scared. But I get to the, to the, to the building, and I go in the, in the front door, and I go up the little stairs towards, towards the bank of elevators. I see, you know, the, the coffee shop on my left and the magazine guy with the cigarettes and the cum and stuff like that on the right all familiar stuff to me, and I go to the elevators, and my heart is racing, and I push the up button, and the elevator opens. I get in the elevator, and I'm thinking, when are they going to buy something from me? It's been two years. When are they gonna... I'm not ready. I guess I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not ready. I'm not, I'm, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. But it goes to the 20th floor, and I get off, and this is what I see. I've been here many times, mind you, but over the years. There's a framed New Yorker on the wall here. I'm not going to take the time to draw it. And um, very simple vestibule, very thin vestibule on the 20th floor, very drab, very boring, very like uh, kind of putty colored walls. And there's a door there. Here I am my little envelope. And the, the funny thing about this vestibule, 
that the elevators over here is that it's this this end of the wall is is one piece of glass and there's um a little slit there and, and a thing to talk and there's a woman sitting here behind the glass and i go up to her with my little envelope and i put the um the envelope in the the, the slit in the wind in the glass and she takes it from me as she's done for weeks that i've been going there and she puts it on our desk and she looks down and then she looks up at me and she says mr lorenz wants to see you <laughs> my heart stopped she's never spoken to me before my heart stopped <laughs> and the next thing I know there's a buzz and it's the door next to me is making that loud noise and I realize okay I have to go in the door so I go in the door and I'm in the inner sanctums of the New Yorker I've done it <laughs> I've sold my first cartoon or maybe I've done something wrong <laughs> this goes on for years I go down to the magazine I put my little envelope in the slit in the, in the glass and then I she hands me back the the envelope I gave her last week with my rejects in it. And I don't get to see Mr. Lorenz again. But I'm selling, and if I'm lucky, with eight cartoons a week, we do about, we cartoonists do about eight to ten cartoons a week, and you submit them, and then you get them back. And you maybe sell one every eight weeks or more. That's a lot of rejection. <laughs> but there's a method to the madness, I, I decided, is that the more you do something, the more you draw, the better you get, right? And you learn to draw for yourself, not for somebody else. Something that I'm not real comfortable with, but I learn to get used to it. Um, the thing is, I didn't really know who I was drawing for or why, and I didn't really notice. So I'm, I'm um, now I'm 46, and I'm sitting in a room with a lot of other women in a conference room, and I'm conducting the first PTA meeting of the year. I'm the PTA president, and uh, it's 8:45, and somebody comes in the room and whispers in my ear, and I take take the information, and then 9:15, somebody else comes in the room and whispers in my ear to tell me that the second tower of the World Trade Centers had fallen. And I end the meeting. And everything is a blur after that. I think for months we, did, we wanted to move to Canada. We were scared. I didn't think I could draw cartoons anymore. What was the point? Um, and then I did this cartoon. I managed to start drawing again. I'm going to try to recreate the cartoon for you. I did that cartoon, and then New Yorker bought it and published it, and I was back on track. I knew why I was drawing. I drew when I was young. I drew for my mother to make her happy. A little later in my teen years, I drew, I think, to try to understand. 
it was a time in our country that was very tumultuous. There was the civil rights movement, the race riots, um, women's liberation, Watergate, assassinations, Vietnam. And I grew up in Washington, D.C., and I think I was trying to, to understand. I was drawing the story of my worry. And I still do that. I still draw about worry. But I think I found another reason to draw, another, another purpose to draw, and that is I draw to connect. My father, when I first started my career, my father said to me, you got the creative genes in the family. And I said, no, no, you're creative too in your field of medicine. You draw, I mean, sorry, you connect with people. That's creative to me. Creativity is about connection. It's about understanding people and listening to people, which is what he did. We all have favorite painters, right? We all have artists that we admire, and we can't believe that they can render something perfectly or render something be so beautifully, and, we, and we, we, we admire their skill. I bet if you ask that painter, talk to the painter about it, they'd say, thank you very much, but I really draw to give you an idea, to connect with you, to, to have a, a dialogue. To me, that's what creativity is about, and I think everyone is creative. And to be truly creative, I think you have to uh, drop a measure of yourself. You have to lose some of the ego so you can fully connect with other human beings and fully tell your story and fully tell theirs and listen to theirs. So creativity is about losing yourself. And I feel so grateful to be able to share my creativity with you. Thank you for your time.